Good afternoon. I bring greetings from the New Republic of New York. We are seceding from the United States, beginning by building a wall across the Hudson, between us and the Hudson River to block entrance from Washington, DC. All right, I'm joking. Uh, but in light of Teddy and Fauna, and also Mia Drag sharing our, our sad experience in the United States, it's, it's nice to have at least a little fun <laughs> with some of the debate. Um, unfortunately, it's just a little fun because the truth is, even yesterday, as we were here in Metro Lab, um, and, and as New York City took the position, and the mayor of New York City took the position, that New York would be a sanctuary city. And that what that meant is when, as you heard Mia Drag say this morning, we have a city in which 38, 40% of our residents were not born in the United States. Uh, that we took the position that all of our residents belong, that we would not participate in any searches and seizures of our people, that all our residents were our people, uh, and that as a result, Donald Trump then announced yesterday that he would seek to cut federal funds from cities like New York because we had agreed to provide sanctuary to all our residents. So that is the contextual reality of our society in the United States today. I would argue that's fairly inhospitable. Uh, but it's also, right, a policy fight. I want to give you a little more context because it's very, very difficult for me to talk about the inside experience on race and class in the United States without sharing a little bit more of a national view, just a little bit, most of which I think will not be a surprise, but just to make sure we're on the same page. And also to say why I'm very explicit about race besides being a black woman, which maybe you didn't know, but now you do. Okay, so the first is that we are in a demographic sea change in the United States and have been for quite a while, but, and are going to continue to be. So as you can see from this chart, uh, the, per the percentage of people in our country who are considered white, which is a social construct, but nonetheless, uh, one that has political and economic and social meaning, is on the decline, not because whites are leaving the country, <laughs> but because whites are having many fewer children, but also we have a lot of both in-migration from other parts of the world that is largely, not exclusively, not white, but largely not white. Uh, and that we have, at the same time, also seeing many more births you know, because a lot of that demographic shift are also younger people, many more births from Latino, Asian, uh, less so the black community, but, but certainly Latino and Asian community, and in fact now the Asian community is the fastest growing in the United States. Some of that, that's a shift, because some of that is about the fact that the United States has become significantly more inhospitable to Latinos, particularly because of Mexican in-migration. So that's just a a link, some of that demographic shift is a link to some of the things you heard Fauna and Teddy talking about, right? Uh, but the other reality, as th there's one thing I don't have on this map, which is that most of that demographic shift is also a generational shift, which is to say the white population is aging. So the vast majority of people who are over 65 will soon be white at the same time that the vast majority of people who right now under 18 and under is already half people of color already. But what this also represents then is our workforce that supports social security, our pension funds, are actually significantly not white and then that's an increase. And earn significantly less money, which is how we pay into our social security system. I say that because that is a way to understand how deeply linked we are in actuality in terms of our well-being that we often don't recognize and don't lean into that from a policy perspective. And this dynamic is equally true in New York City, but it's true nationwide. Uh, the other is that we've talked about is wealth inequality. 
But, right, we all know because it's a global phenomenon that a very, very few people hold most of the wealth of the world. It is also true though, and this is a, just the United States, but that's a highly racialized picture. So as you can see from this, the top 1% in the United States, right, significantly more, more wealth uh, than the rest of us, but let's look at it by race. So the blue line that you see, right, is white wealth. The white, the, you see the green is non-white, the pink over here is African American or black, and over here the gray is Latino. Uh, I didn't put the Asian numbers, I didn't put all the numbers, but as you can see, not only is we, do we have a wealth disparity, but we have a racial wealth disparity. So it is not the case that we have a race-neutral wealth divide. We have a highly racialized wealth divide. That does not mean that white people in the United States are okay. That's not what that means. But let me give you one example of how important it is to understand who is excluded how. So if we had a housing bubble in 2007, it exploded, it led to, I'm testing, see if you're awake. It led to a recession, a global recession even, right? It also then resulted in many, many, many people losing their homes across the United States. One of the things that we saw, though, is remember the people losing their homes often had what we call subprime mortgages, right? Subprime, meaning they were getting mortgages, they were considered risky credit risk, so they got very, very bad credit terms. They had to pay a lot more money in interest for their mortgages, for their loans, than people who are in the prime market. Now, if you hear me say that, who do you assume then are getting the high-priced mortgages in terms of their profile, their, dem their profile in terms of their income? People with less money, right? That would be rational. The reality is, if you were white, and earning $50,000 a year, you were less likely to have a subprime loan than if you were black earning $150,000 a year. That actually also explodes some of our notion of class, right? Because we think, oh, if we pay attention to people who are lower income, we're all treated you know, the same according to our class, but that's in fact not true in the United States doesn't mean, again, that many white people did not lose their homes. Of course they did. It, the point of it is to say we're, we all experience the structures differently based on our racial identification, and often that's for policy reasons, for policy decisions that were made. And I'm going to go, that's, this is important for why we decided to do things in a certain way in, the, in New York City. Uh, this is just one more example of uh, the fact that mobility, and, and in this picture I mean economic mobility is not race neutral. Um, this is actually research that is national uh, that shows that after the civil rights victories that we had in the 1960s, which were significantly important, significantly important for our country, nonetheless, nonetheless, if you were white in a high poverty neighborhood, you had significantly more economic mobility than if you were black in a high poverty neighborhood. And that's essentially what this graph is showing. And that, by the way, if you were black in a high poverty neighborhood, even if you were at the top income bands, you were more likely to, your children were more likely to experience downward mobility, economic mobility. That is not a race neutral picture. Right? And it is not, class alone cannot explain that. Okay. So when we, at least in my organization that I founded, where we worked on these issues very aggressively, talked about structural inclusion, right? We did not use a rights-based framework, not because we don't believe in rights, but we used an inclusion and a structural inclusion framework because in our context, the conversation around class 
always erased race. And if we talked about race, people thought we were just, you had to find a bad actor, a bad person, who intended to treat you differently because of your race. But the dynamics that I'm showing you are not just based on intentional discrimination. They're based on a long history of decisions that have over and over again produced multiple exclusions from opportunity, even while we have made significant and important and critical strides on anti-discrimination. So we need the rights, and I fight for rights, and I support rights, I, but this is to make it more complex, a picture. Uh, because also the right wing in our country has said, we don't need to do any more on race because we no longer allow discrimination. Except then we reproduce all these exclusions over and over, and in some instances make them worse by not paying attention to race. So one of the things we articulated is what do we mean by inclusion? This is what we mean by inclusion. It's that if we are included, these are things that we have. We have good jobs. We can access health care. We have homes. We have green space and healthy environment. We have food security, right, and quality food. We have all these things that are actually important to our, to our well-being. And, in, and the truth is, and sometimes without regard to income, <laughs> communities of color do not have these things, right? So we define inclusion. All right, everyone from the master class has already heard me say this. We define inclusion as the fair, fair, right? I'm going to. I got a pop quiz for the class after this. The fair distribution of the benefits and burdens of society, right? And by fair, okay, class, what word did I not use? Equal. equal. I did not use the word equal. And why did I not use the word equal? Because being equal should be okay. Being e treated equally does not be mean necessarily mean being treated fairly. If I am, and uh, another very practical real world example, if I have a health insurance card and you have a health insurance card, are we being treated equally? We both have health, at least for health care. We both have health insurance cards, right? Is that equal? Yes. Do we have the same health outcomes? Not necessarily. And why might we not have the same health outcomes? I might not have a clinic or a doctor that I can access. But say I can access the doctor or the clinic. Why else might, why might I not have the same access to health? Yes, you can still be treated differently. By the way, you can still be treated differently without a conscious intent to treat you differently, right? And we have, we have research that show that black Americans who are middle class with health care are less likely to get pain medication, are less likely to get certain kinds of screenings. I once went to a doctor because I was having, in law school, I was having stomach cramps, I thought it was law school that was giving me the stomach cramps. Uh, and the doctor said, oh, you're black. It's, you can't drink milk. I was like, oh, well, that was easy. <laughs> and 10 years later, I stopped drinking milk. My stomach cramps were still there, but I then thought that was confirmation that it was, in fact, law school. Turns out it was gluten. I can't eat bread. But he made a stereotypical decision about what my health needs might be based on my racial profile. Right? So that's not, that's not fair, but it's equal because I had the same access to a doctor that all my classmates had. Right? So I say we in define inclusion this way because we should be, in our view, looking at outcomes. Outcomes. What, what's different for people? What do they have? We all have to carry burdens in society, right? Taxes, 
opening the doors for each other. All these things matter, right? But, but the fairness is we shouldn't, if I'm poorer, I shouldn't be paying more of my income than someone who's wealthy, right? That's not fair. So th this notion that it's about a fair distribution is critically important because so much of our policy discussion has been about equal, right? If we all have the same access or we all have the same whatever, we all then have the same outcomes, but no, we don't. So we have to think about it in a, in a more complex and nuanced way, and we have to look at everybody. So who, when I say race, who comes to mind? You think these are trick questions, but they're not. Who comes to mind? If, if I say race, who do you think of? Trump. Trump. It's true, unfortunately, uh, because he uses race all the time. <laughs> but Trump has a race. Trump has a race. And this is the point. When we say race, we typically think of people of color in the United States, but everyone has a race. So white is still a race, but it gets normalized. The privilege of it gets normalized and made invisible. Right? So the problem isn't that we all have a race, it's making it invisible and then normalizing the hierarchy that we've created because of it. So we have to find a way in all that we do, which includes some of the work that we've been doing in the Metro Lab, which has been a pure pleasure to, to work with, of finding how to make it fair, not just equal, but fair in the outcomes it produces for people, no matter who they are, which means things may have to be somewhat different for different groups. But we have to do that, and in New York, we face this all the time, we're, we were facing fairness in the context of tremendous fragmentation. So one level of fragmentation is that New York City is not just the city. It's our wealthy suburbs, we have a tri-state area, but a lot of that wealth that exists outside of the city that benefits from the services my tax dollars pay for in the city, that the burden of those in, in amenities were not being supported by our suburbs. Now that's a reality that we could not do anything about because politically we had no power to make suburbs provide any support to the city, right? Be and that fragmentation, by the way, is historic and it's racially driven. So even while the reality of it is not intentionally racist today, it is based on a lot of decisions about how government invested in housing, who got government-backed mortgages, which were white people, not black people, or not Latinos, or not Asians, and that created our white suburbs. So we have to deal with that fragmentation um, it's also fragmentation at the neighborhood level because we are one of the most segregated cities in the country. Now we have 8.5 million people, so we are the largest city in the country and the most diverse. But it's not just that we're the largest. Does anyone know who the ne what the next, next largest cities are in the US? Los Angeles, Chicago, and Hughes, A plus. A plus, you can all go home. Um, those are the three next largest cities in the US. New York is as large as those three cities combined. So it's not just that we're larger. We're larger by a significant factor. The other thing is we have 330 square miles of land, but we have islands, <laughs> which means we're dense. Right? Because we can't, we don't have a lot of land to build on, and land is at a premium. And the other thing to note is that in addition, Mia Drag said a lot about our demographics. We are extremely diverse. We have 800 languages that can be tracked and identified. We probably have more, but that's how many have been identified. In a city in which we had, were doing language translation on three languages. But not only that, highly racially segregated. I'm going to share something else that is. So we had to look at power as, as, and its relationship to policy. Um, 
as a city, and I would argue as a country, and I would argue it as, as a world, right? So even in the context of the Metro Lab and the projects that we were looking at, I think the idea of inclusion must include this notion of power. Who has power to, to even voice what the needs are and what the experiences are and what might shift them to produce different outcomes, right? And that's why applied research is so important and engagement with stakeholders is so important. So on the policy front though, we had to confront this as a city because one of the reasons why we have that type of fragmentation and that type of racialized poverty and differences in mobility is because, for many reasons, but one significant is the decision on how to invest in community. So I'm not going to talk about all of the investment issues we have. I'm going to talk mostly about housing and internet access today. But you can take what I'm saying and, what, and apply it to a range of different issues that we were dealing with as a city. The first thing we did is we identified those communities that were racially identifiable and had been excluded from public investment. What I mean by that is maybe didn't have a subway line, maybe not even adequate bus service, uh, poor housing, no grocery stores, crumbling schools, horrible relationships with the police department, over-policed and over-criminalized. I mean, any number of parade of horribles and exclusions you can imagine. And we decided to look specifically about how we target resources in those communities. Um, and I want to say something about policy here because I think it's often misunderstood. Policy at its root is action. So one of the things that you know, we were constantly struggling with is this notion of we need to change policy, but policy was not just law. It's not just rule making. Many of the things we were doing were policies. And I think that's true, you know, particularly for the architects in the room. Like, I think architects make policy all the time because you're acting, right? And you're acting in a way that designs the interaction of people. But it's not even just the interaction. It's not even just physical. It's, it, it really also includes what kinds of decisions are made on resources, on infrastructure, on how the, those investments are made. And sometimes that includes pretty radical policy interventions, even when we're not always thinking about it that way. So policy is action. So all the kinds of decisions we were making as government, we considered policy, even who we gave a contract to to do a piece of work for the city is a policy decision, even if it's not a law change. So we thought about women and minority owned businesses because our fastest growing small businesses, which were much more likely to create jobs for people in communities of high unemployment and who were generally not considered desirable by employers, were women owned and particularly people of color owned small businesses. So it became important for us to look at how we were making decisions about who we contracted with. In some instances, and this, was, this is the insider view, and if you say this publicly, I'll have to hunt you down. It meant we had to spend more money. Because the cost, it's a lot cheaper to do a very large contract. A small business cannot do the same scale of contract. They're not big enough. So we had to make a policy decision that we were going to break up contracts and do many more smaller contracts so that we could allow more competition for the small businesses owned by people traditionally excluded from the economy and from the business of the city. So that's one of the ways in which, still competitive, they still had to win the bid. We didn't change the rules in terms of winning a contract. What we did is create more possibility to compete successfully. Okay? But that's a good example of how neutrality and believing that by erasing race, by erasing gender, we were being neutral and fair was not, because it wasn't creating the same opportunity to compete. So when we started looking at housing, all right, like many, many, many cities, it's not unique to New York, we are far too expensive for the vast majority of our people, no matter their race. 
We have, um, this is just a snapshot of median household income by borough. Manhattan, almost $70,000. That sounds like a lot of money, right? Doesn't that sound like a lot of money? I don't know. I thought, there were many years of my life I didn't earn that. But the cost of living, according to one of our think tanks in New York City, just for a decent life, not a lavish life, not going on expensive vacations, not eating out at fancy restaurants, just a basic, basic, decent quality of life, just a decent home, just being able to be with your family, just being able to have your basic needs met, nothing more than that, $91,000 a year for a family of three. So that's our median, but that's not the cost of just a basic life. Uh, in Queens, as you can see, it's a little more than 50. I mean, we obviously, I, didn't, I don't even have, um, I don't even have uh, the Bronx on here because we have five boroughs. But what I want to point out is how these numbers also mask things because Staten Island is actually where we have some of our deepest pockets of poverty, but we also have some of our greatest wealth. And so it skews our median income dramatically. But it also shows you that the median income in Staten Island where we perceive great poverty because there is great poverty, also, actually, at a median level, looks like Manhattan. So community scale matters a lot uh, in looking at these numbers. But, um, the, but the point is, none of these, even as a median, come anywhere close to the cost of living just for a bas basic needs being met. And the three primary reasons for that in New York, housing cost, health care, can anyone guess the third? Nope. Nope. Child care. Child care. So one of the things that the mayor did, and it was the very first thing we did, now he ran on, I should say, he ran on a platform. What he said he would do is he said he would address income inequality. And in New York, when 46% of our people struggle just to pay their bills by the end of every month, that was a very important platform. One of the ways he said he was gonna do it is he said, I'm gonna create universal preschool, or crash, right? But for four years old, because we don't get free public education until five or six. But it also, for low-income families, this is one of those invisible unfairnesses, can't afford private education for their kids before age six. It's too expensive, and often can't afford quality daycare because they just can't pay for it. So what that meant is, and the city, it had some free pre-K, but not universal, half day, not full day. How many of you work a half day? I personally have three jobs, so <laughs> I don't work anywhere near a half day. So if you can't afford to pay for private care, then you have informal situation for your children, and your children may also not be get, given educational opportunity, and it costs you money if, if you can afford to pay anything. So we created a universal pre-K program. The politics of it was ugly. Um, the governor, it, we don't have the power in the city to raise our, ta our income taxes. We can raise our property taxes, but as you know, that's not necessarily a fair indication of ability to pay. Uh, and the mayor said, we want to raise our income taxes on those who make $500,000 or more a year. That's not very many people in our city. And it would have cost them $900 a year in taxes, in tax increase, making $500,000 a year. The governor said no because he was running for re-election and did not want to raise, didn't want to be a governor who raised taxes. Uh, and we had a big, big, big public fight, but part of what we had to do as a city to have that public fight is we as government had to become organizers of community. We had to engage our local communities that needed this to fight for it. So it meant that we expanded the capacity uh, we even have a, we have a government agency that works for the mayor's office called the Community Affairs Unit. 
and we increase the size of staffing for the Community Affairs Unit. And essentially, the Community Affairs Unit are the government staff that serve as direct connection between the mayor's office and, and local neighborhoods and local leaders. So we increase the capacity of government to be in conversation with those folks. We can't tell them what to do as government, but we can tell them what we're trying to do and tell them what positions other elected officials are taking. Right? So the information that we can give by having direct touch to community created that power. And ultimately, we didn't win our right to raise our taxes, but the governor put in the budget line in the state budget so that we would have resources. And within one year, we created 70,000 full-day quality pre-K seats in the city of New York. Um, that, we believe, saved families $10,000 a year. Now, anyone can get that seat. If you make $500,000 a year, you can get a free pre-K seat. It's universal. But it's also fair, because for those who have choices and those who don't, now those who don't have a quality program to go to and save money that they desperately need to pay bills. But the, mo the more important thing is housing in our context, because our housing costs have risen dramatically. We also have extremely segregated housing, right? Where people live and who they live with, they typically look like their neighbor. We, don't, we do have pockets of diversity. My neighborhood's very diverse, but it's rare. Um, and even in my neighborhood, homeowners are typically white and renters are typically immigrant people of color from Central America uh, and from the West Indies and Africa. So, um, one of the things that we had was at our disposal was the fact that we did have a state law that stabilized rents in certain buildings. It's about half of our city's rental units are rent stabilized. That means landlords cannot raise the rents. They cannot just decide they're gonna raise their rents. So as a neighborhood gentrifies, a landlord can't just toss out their poor renter and then raise the rents to double, double or whatever the market value. And, and here's a good example. This is just Manhattan. But as you know, Manhattan's extremely expensive. So for those living in housing that is not rent stabilized, $100,000 is the average income. So generally wealthier. Uh, in rent stabilized housing, the general earnings or the average earnings are 49,000. So big difference in terms of who's in these apartments. Uh, and the rents, as you can see, if it's a market rent, it's, it's closer to almost $2,700 a month. And in stabilized, $1,300 a month, so substantially lower. Now, one of the things that we had available to us is it's the city that has a rent guidelines board. The mayor appoints who sits on the guidelines board, not exclusively, but has a majority of the votes. We picked people to sit on the board who cared about poor people <laughs> and people of color. And so it's all research driven, but the point is they weren't politically ignoring the research. Because what was really happening in previous years is the rent guidelines board was politicized. Mayors typically wanted to please landlords because they're more effective at getting people elected, right? And they can finance campaigns, poor people can't. Poor people of color often ignored in terms of housing needs. So we put people on who cared, and they read the research and said, two years running, landlords don't need to increase rents to, pay, to cover their costs and to make a profit. You can't raise your rents. Zero rent increase in for the past two years. First time in the history of the Rent Guidelines Board. Because keeping those rents down was part of keeping housing affordable. But also, and by the way, huge political hits. Right? Again, in terms of power, the people who have power, typically white, typically higher income, typically property owners. Um, so who we saw as our constituents mattered a lot. Um, but then the other thing, uh, let me, before I go to that. So the, because this is the tension, and I, I think it's, it's coming up in the projects as well, because gentrification is a huge area of tension, right? and it's coming up in the Metro Lab. Uh, and we've been dealing with it as well. So one of those tensions is you have segregate, racial segregation on one hand, right? 
How many people think that's a good thing? Neither do I. Uh, and then on, we want integrated, we want interaction, right? How can we have hospitality in the absence of having any way of knowing each other and having experiences with each other and seeing each other as part of the same community? Uh, but we don't actually live together. And by and large, by the way, we don't even work together because even our employment sectors are highly racialized in terms of where people are. So, uh, but we also had the fact that because New York is such a popular, popular place, our population is growing, uh, but developers by and large wanted to build luxury housing, and they wanted to charge $4,000 a month for housing. I'm not even exaggerating. Several of my colleagues are paying $4,000 a month for a two-bedroom apartment. Um, so the previous mayor had made a decision that at, as an economic development strategy, he would allow all of this luxury housing to be built um, and very little attention to affordable. What we did is the mayor said, we are going to say two things. We, we will allow you to build bigger, taller buildings. Because we're on an island, we don't have a lot of land. <laughs> land is at a premium, so what developers want to do is build higher. And our zoning laws in many neighborhoods don't allow it, right? Now, and by the way, in rent-stabilized buildings, you can't tear down. And that's older housing stock. And some people would argue, tear down, let, take, get rid of the rent stabilization program, let, let landlords develop bigger buildings, and that will create more affordable housing. I would argue they'll just make market rate housing, but that's a real policy debate, right? But in this context, it was, we focused on the poorest communities that needed affordable housing, but were also poor and isolated. And we said, we'll, we will change the zoning rules so as long as you agree, and by the way, this is mandatory, so you can't get the permit unless you mandate 30% of the units you will build will be affordable. That, that meant that, that you could go higher and therefore build more units. Uh, and that by definition, then, those would be mixed-income buildings in largely low-income communities. But because of our housing pressures, a lot of those communities are communities of color. Actually, all of them are. Um, they're racially identifiable. Some are Latino, some are black, some are Latino and black, but they're very... And white folks were starting to move in because they're getting pushed out of other neighborhoods because of cost, but they generally earn much more. And the, na the folks that were there... We're saying, well, now we're going to get pushed out. And if you allow this development, that's just going to continue to push us out. So our compromise position was, OK, half of those affordable units must go to community residents as a way of ensuring that it's not just affordable, but that people who live there benefit from the affordability. Right? And so much less opportunity for them to get pushed out. If, I mean, they don't have to stay, but if they want to stay, they can apply for the, those rental units, and a certain percent, 50% would be protected for them. We were then sued by some of my friends, I'm a civil rights lawyer by training, for racially segregating housing. So here's a very good example of two very important things that we all, all value, right? Integration with affordability and the ability for people to benefit. And yet we now have a fight in New York where those are seen as at odds. And it's not completely wrong because some of those neighborhoods, um, some of that housing will go to people who are white in that 50% community residence. So it's, it's not even completely wrong that some of those units will, will then benefit people who are white. So um, this, by the way, is being resolved in the courts. But we won the, the local legislation to change it. And by the way, this pitted communities against each other and communities all of whom were our constituencies. Some folks also complained that we weren't making enough low-income housing, right, and that because we were allowing bans, 
Um, so very, very, very poor people would get a percentage of those affordable units, but also some people at more working class and middle, and middle but struggling would get some of those units. Uh, because economically mixed housing is also important. And some folks said, no, it should all be the lowest uh, income residents who get the affordable units. So my point is, um, in the engagement process, and it was a very active, very contested process, uh, we as, an, as a political administration <laughs> had to make choices. I won't stand here today and tell you whether we made the right ones or not. Because to me, the issue is the outcome not the decision. I'm not gonna celebrate the decision until I know what the outcome is. And if I see a net improvement in fairness, in carrying the benefits and burdens of our decisions, I will call that a success. If I do not see that, I will say we failed. And I think this is my real lesson from the trenches is sometimes you don't know you make the best decision you can, as consciously as you can, with as much engagement as you can, and as much debate as you can, and as much inclusive debate. I mean, we actively had town halls with the communities. We met with organizers from the communities who disagreed with us. We confronted the attorneys who wanted to sue us. We had all of, so we had a lot of engagement. We, we had to deal with the city council members who had to decide if they were gonna vote for our legislative changes or not. In the end, our, some things change, right? We increased some of the affordability categories, recognizing that there were some legitimate issues, but we didn't do as much as some of the activists wanted us to. Um, and I think we feel, and I will say I feel good about what we did in the sense that I think we made the best choices balancing the most complex issues, but, I think it's also really important to have a sense of humility um, and acknowledge that until we're able to know the impacts, we don't really know if we've succeeded. It may even take years to know that because it takes time to build housing. What I can say is that we've already added 53,000 units of affordable housing. We have also we increased from a rights perspective. We actually did something the city funded not free lawyers to represent tenants to protect them from unlawful eviction and harassment when they were in private housing, right? Not housing we could control. So then what we did is gave them resources they don't get. Landlords have lawyers, tenants get evicted. Sometimes because the landlord is manipulating the system, the rates of eviction have dropped 40% in the city since we funded lawyers to represent tenants. The 80% of tenants in housing court were not represented by attorneys. Now a significantly higher number are, and we've seen a radical drop in eviction. And again, those are largely people of color. So by looking comprehensively, thinking about where rent is stabilized, how do we keep it affordable, where people are in housing we don't control because it's private housing, how do we protect their rights and ensure that they are not being harassed and improperly evicted? give them some of the things they can't typically afford, and then how do we create more housing that starts to create more mixed communities, but preserving the ability for some of those residents to stay in community and get some of the benefit of the housing, not just the burden of it coming, which is far too often exclusion from the neighborhood. So the one last thing I will give an example of, um, and then I'll open it up to discussion is, now when I came into the administration, I was thinking about something the mayor wasn't. And one of the things I appreciated about him as a leader, in fact, the real story is, I wrote a piece uh, in December at, after he was elected. One of the things that I was looking at from a perspective of exclusion was one of the pieces of infrastructure that is critically important to allow people to innovate and be in the economy and solve some of their problems is internet access. Because nowadays, if you don't have the internet, you actually, you can't even apply for a job anymore unless you do it online. Uh, homework is given online. Um, so what we did, and in New York, we have literally 22% of our city, remember, we have 8.5 million people. 
22% of our residents did not have high-speed internet at home. Uh, and um, that's just crazy. <laughs> in a society where you can't even do your homework in the absence of internet, including our public school students. You can't even apply for a job. Um, people were going to McDonald's because McDonald's figured out that because people didn't have access, they could make more money by providing free internet service to poor people. So in poor neighborhoods, they started offering free Wi-Fi so that people had to, so parents were taking their kids to McDonald's to do their homework and then feeding their kids food that was gonna kill them. So, you know, from a whole structural perspective, this was very troubling, smart on McDonald's part. Um, but very, then that's just one example. Um, so I, I was, you can't, we're not going to end income inequality and create racial fairness in the absence of investing in internet infrastructure. But the private sector won't do it because they don't want the subscribers who can't pay $100 a month, their infrastructure costs are too high. So what we did, um, so I wrote this article in December looking at these local neighborhood models where people had banded together in nonprofits to create free wireless service for in very low income neighborhoods and I said the city needs to figure out how to make that happen all around the city and support that. And so the mayor called me in and said you're going to be my counsel and I was like I am and he said yep and he said and then you're going to make that broadband thing happen and I said Oh, shit. Um, I wanted him to figure it out. I didn't mean I was going to. So what we did, so I, and I say this in part with great humility. I knew how important it was as an issue of racial equity. That doesn't mean I knew how to do it, <laughs> right? And government is called upon all the time to deal with these extremely important social problems with having no clue how, no matter what we say. And people lie. They're like, I know how to do this. No, they don't. The, all the things we're struggling with in Metro Lab, all these, con right? Médecins du monde, you know, forêt. I, I mean, we're all struggling with this, and if we act like we know what the answer is, we're lying. So I was like, all right, I don't know how to do this, so I gotta get with a whole bunch of people and do a whole lot of thinking, and then we gotta figure out, and how to figure out how to resource it. So we did a, uh, so, but just to, I'm gonna, this is just to show that obviously if you're poor, the rate of lack of broadband at home obviously goes way up, largely racialized, um, forget that. So what we did, this, these are photographs of our public housing, right? Um, these are developments where we have, in all boroughs, we have one in every borough, where we are, I, I shouldn't say we anymore, because I just left it to other people after I created it, but we are putting in free residential broadband service to every resident of these developments. We are gonna reach 21,000 people just with these five projects. Um, the next level is to think about what can residents do with it? Not just can they get online, not just do they have a computer, that's transactional. And I think this is really important. To think that it's enough to just make it, put it there, is to ignore people's lived experience. Because the question is, what innovation does it drive? How does it help people connect? How does it help them solve the next level of problems because now they have a tool they didn't have before? So we've been engaging, and on the university side, what we're doing, and I'm teaching a lab very much like Metro Lab, but on digital equity, in terms of what now our residents in public housing will be able to innovate and problem solve because now they have a tool that they didn't have before. Now they have an investment that they didn't have before. Um, so that, I, I will stop there because that's, I could go on. Um, I will make one last point because we've been talking a lot about this, uh, what inclusion means in the context of hospitality. And I believe very strongly that, and I, and I think the way we've heard it today and what I would reflect on is, and the way I think it's coming up in our projects in Metro Lab, is we, hospitality is both an input, <laughs> meaning people have to come into a space and start being in agreement and inhospitable in that they have to work together, right, across a lot of difference. I mean, certainly in the projects that we have in Metro Lab, that's clearly got to be the case, 
as part of making it successful, right? Um, it's also an outcome, meaning if we do our work right, we can measure that there is an increase, and I would say not of tolerance, I mean, to, to pick up on, you know, making much more deep and rich this notion of hospitality, not in tolerance, in outcome. Are people healthier? Are their educational levels higher? Is the quality of their housing better? All those things are primary indicators of whether what, I, what I'm hearing as a more um, rich definition of hospitality is actually having. Um, for me, uh, I see hospitality as part of inclusion, but inclusion must include power. Uh, if, if, our, if folks who are impacted by our policies, by which I'm saying actions, are not actually part of the creation, part of the figuring it out, the likelihood that it's going to represent their needs and reflect their experiences is much lower. And that is not hospitality, and that is not inclusion in its broader sense. So um, I don't think we did that uh, as well as we could have as a city. I think that's something we still struggle with. Uh, I think we, there are certain things we have done better than previous administrations by recognizing the fact that we need to focus on the communities that had not been receiving attention, being in dialogue with them. I think that's an improvement. Um, I don't think it's sufficient. And I think some of the examples we were hearing from Teddy and Fauna from Colombia and Medellin are not things that we've done in New York. Um, I think it's not been yet part of our evolution. I think it's part of what many of us want to see us getting to, um, is a much different kind of public discourse, because our discourse is also, a la Donald Trump, as a primary example, highly racialized. Um, the one last thing I'll say, because uh, I think it's relevant to this notion of um, inclusion, is in policing. Uh, it's not enough, obviously, to have space that's designed the, the design is incredibly important. Um, but the reason I talk about the other policy aspects is if the police are harassing people because of the way they look or their country of origin or their language group or the way they're dressed and stopping them and frisking them and arresting them and then releasing them without charge because they were really deciding that they're bad people just based on who the, what they look like we cannot possibly have an inclusive society. And our policing deeply embedded those notions of people of color as criminals, as dangerous, as carriers of weapons, when the vast majority of them were law-abiding citizens. Um, so it's another thing we've been working on very aggressively. I won't go into all the details about it, but I say that because the relationship, being a structuralist, is to recognize that all these things are linked. So. I think the power and the importance of Metro Lab is that inclusive design is about inclusive engagement and recognizing the multiplicity of issues and actions that have to take place in order for a place to become more than the sum of its parts. So it's been an incredible privilege to join Metro Lab. I am so deeply grateful to the Metro Lab team, both for doing it and for having the engagement, but to the participants in particular, your work. It is cutting edge. It will make a difference. It's exactly the kind of experimentation that influences those of us in government and outside of government all the time, even if the projects don't happen. So I'll stop there and open it up. Uh, my name's Adrian Hill. Um, thank you so much, uh, um, Maya. It's a, such a, a heartfelt uh, presentation. It's fantastic to see someone uh, embedded in government to be really throwing themselves at a at a topic. Yeah, right under the bus. So <laughs> <myself right. laughs> Good luck. <laughs> um, look, the the question I had, about which, which I have, is 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 the point that you uh, ended your presentation with, which is. Uh, n not only addressing, I suppose, the, the, the fairness, but also involving the people that are, are, are most uh, uh, in need of that, because that process is s such an important part of the, the 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 value creation. You know, I mean, much of what you've spoken about is still the the heavy hand of uh, uh, of government, which yes. is 
you know, top driven uh, and 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 essentially catering to need, but uh, uh, still is not involving people. And that's, I yeah. suppose, the involvement is very much part of the Absolutely. education process. Um, here in Brussels, we have a fantastic. Uh, well, for good or for bad, it's a very interesting program called the Neighbourhood Contracts, the, the mm -hmm. Contrat de Quartier. Mm -hmm. How do you see New York addressing these things mm -hmm. in the future? Um, well, I think first of all, I. Definitely you heard me correctly because I would say if there's a fair critique, it's that a lot of the ideas were good ideas, but there was, uh, and there was some engagement, but it's engagement after the idea formation, right? Not engagement in the idea formation. So, um, and, and there's a tension there for government, right? Because so often, I, what I think the mayor was right about is the hard politics of it. If we didn't fight, if we had created a process of engagement around what you, you, whether to have universal pre-K and what it should look like, we would have never won it with the governor. <laughs> uh, I mean, he would have used it as a way to essentially stop it from happening, potentially try to delay it long enough so that the mayor, if he wasn't reelected, he might be able to get away with not addressing it. It was also an election year, so it was leveraging the ability to have it matter that people in communities were yelling at the governor. So there is a hard politics that is real um, that sometimes means government doesn't have the time. Um, so I'm just saying it as a real tension. I'm not saying it as a value judgment. It's just one of the tensions we faced. Um, I also think there are plenty of times when we could slow down. Um, and I think there's a difference between thinking, is this one of the things we can't afford to slow down on and it's better to, uh, you know, we think the calculus is that it's better to get this thing done than to slow it down and possibly not get it at all? Or do we think that, so for instance, in, in the affordable housing context, I probably would have slowed it down. Because we had the real estate developers on our side, they were thrilled. They were like, wait, we can go higher? We're in. Because Right, and so this, but that that meant we had more time. So, I think we should have had a real discussion and debate in each community around: Is it better to have fewer units, but lower cost housing, or is it better to have more units and some of that housing be a little more expensive? Because that's a policy choice, right? And maybe a community says, you know what, we'd rather have half the number of units that are affordable, but it being the poorest of the poor, then, so maybe we want 100,000 units, not, to, we had committed to 200,000, right? Uh, I think we could have taken the time for that, and the way to have it would have been um, to actually have organized, which I think there are times when we have done it, we just don't do it systematically, which is to make sure everyone has all the information we have, <laughs> Right, so they have all the facts, the costs of it, the financing, not be paternalistic about it, but say, here's all the data. I mean, we'll break it down, uh, that, that project that um, Mia Drag talked about this morning, Center for Urban Pedagogy, and he shared the zoning. That zoning work was part of the housing work I'm talking about. My brother happens to work with that group, um, so I know that work a lot. That pedagogy, is, it takes very complex information and breaks it down so that folks can absorb it. Um, and then allow a process of discussion that we don't lead as government. Because usually what happens is when we have discussions with community, we lead the discussion. We'll say, we'll have a town hall, we'll stand up in front of you and we'll answer your questions. Which is important. I mean, I think we should do that. But that's not, it's, uh, it's creating the space for community to have all the information and have its own discussions and then feed it back into government, right? So um, that for me would be a very robust process and we don't do enough of it. Hi, my name is uh, Delphine Morel. I'm a counselor for a council member in uh, Scarbeck. It's one of the yeah. powers of Brussels, so I work in politics too. <laughs> um, I had actually two questions. Uh, there's one word I didn't hear from you, and it's um, gender. Mm -hmm. Do you also- I said women-owned businesses, but okay. Yes. But do you also address the gender issue the same way you yeah. address racial issues? Well, so let me ask you something. What am I? Woman. <laughs> no, no, I, I, and I don't mean that to be funny. I, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, 
uh, part of it is a language problem, which we, we don't have the language yet to speak easily about intersectionality. So there's sexuality, there's, you know, biological gender, there's, so we've done, a, so we created a gender commission, um, but we were explicit about needing to look at race and sexuality intersections with that gender commission, meaning I don't think it's gender or race. I think it's how do we understand how people are positioned. So, uh, and we had a data problem because we don't always have the data to disaggregate by race and gender in all the ways we like. But the short answer is it was critically important to us. Um, there were many, so we created a gender equity commission. Um, we put as commissioners, um, uh, and it reported to me, we put as commissioners a lot of women who were activists in various local neighborhoods. So we didn't just do the, uh, uh, you know, the big names in gender equity. We actually made them local. We had a lot of local leaders. Um, we then had them, uh, uh, and then we were creating a process by which our commissioners had to present gender equity plans to the commission so that the commission could give feedback to those commissioners on whether they had a sufficient gender lens. But also being explicit about that gender lens, including you know, um, South Asian women in Queens and <laughs> Jewish women in the Hasidic community and, right? Because it's not just women, those are, those are women who are positioned very, very, very differently in the city. So that's just one example. Um, we did some stuff also with our Human Rights Commission, which also reported to me uh, on, on um, gender neutral bathrooms, because that was a huge issue for our transgender community. Uh, and then starting to deal with some of the violence issues in policing because it's actually transgender women of color who are disproportionately um, murdered, raped, uh, sexually harassed, and there was very little safety or protection for them in how the policing was working for them as a demographic. So many, many, and, I, and, and not enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's how we were starting to okay. approach it. And then I had another question regarding the um, two years uh, you, well, sorry, it's the end of the day. Um, regarding the fact that you stopped uh, the loans getting higher, how did, did you develop a tool to um, get the landlords renovating the, the buildings while you, they couldn't raise the loans? Oh, the, um, uh, the, not the rents. Yes, the rents. The, re Sorry. the rents. Um, so it was an already existing state law. Uh, we didn't create it. It was, we've had the law on the books in the state of New York since the late 1960s. Um, the issue there was more, so it was really more just an issue of the rent guidelines board saying, don't raise the rents. Because each year, the board has to reevaluate whether landlords because of the costs they're incurring, have a good argument for, for raising the, the rents. Um, so each year you look at that data, but typically even if that data showed that the landlords could afford a zero rent increase, they were still winning rent increases. Uh, and by the way, rents in the city typically have been going up, say, I'm not sure if I'm remembering the statistic correctly, 14%. Um, while wages increased 2%. So that's if you plotted that on the graph, you would see that every single year people are less able to pay. <laughs> so the keeping it to zero, knowing that in wages were not increasing, was very important. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how, that's how it worked. There's a whole longer fight that has to have about rent stabilization in general because landlords can take units out of the program. That's a, but that's a whole nother fight. Um, hi, uh, my name is uh, Yannick Destex. I'm a PhD student. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you. Uh, uh, I've got a, a question about um, the inclusive debates you spoke about. So you defined uh, inclusive as fair mm -hmm. and not equal access to something, kind of. And so I was wondering, how do you, uh, how do you proceed to conduct uh, fair inclusion in your debates and discussion? That's I have a whole class I teach on that. Um, seriously, because that's a that's a really complicated question. So if you so one of the things that happens in the way we debate in the U.S. at least is 
they're two different frames. So people like me will use a communitarian frame, like we're, we're all in this together. We may be situated differently and have different needs, but we are all connected, like my point about social security, right? It hurts white people that people of color don't have good paying jobs, because it hurts them at retirement. And our social security system is in danger because we're not paying enough attention to, to the economic mobility of our young black and Latino and Asian residents. Um, so I tend to talk about it in that way uh, so that everyone sees themselves in it uh, because competition, what breaks it down is what Donald Trump has done. He makes it an us, them. You, this is how we won the election not exclusively, the Electoral College, which is not... So, oh, I promised me a drug because I fought with him this morning. Donald Trump did not win the election. Three million more people voted for Hillary Clinton. He won the Electoral College, <laughs> not the popular vote. The Electoral College exists because it was created at the time of slavery explicitly not to allow the popular vote to win, and it was a highly racialized and class decision, and we're living with it today. Okay, that was my aside. But I was so frustrated because I refused to say that he won the, the election. Um, but the, the, I think the point about how you talk about it, so what he did very effectively is the way you use a race wedge and, and an individual lens. The Mexicans, he didn't even do it well. I mean, that's what's shocking about it. Usually the way it's done effectively is more what Ronald Reagan did uh, and others, which is to say very egalitarian things in very racially coded ways. So, for instance, people will say, and some of our members of Congress have said this, we think everyone deserves a job and everyone you know, ha needs the ability to support their family. So we can't spend our taxes on those people who don't want to work. Who are those people? That immediately maps to people of color, it, psychologically, I mean cognitively, not, not explicitly, because the stereotype is that people of color don't work because our unemployment rates are higher and because we have racially identifiable communities, some of which have 50% unemployment rates for people who are 18 to 22. And so when you see that, it drives the stereotype that you don't work, your community is lazy. But no one has to use those words anymore, it's coded. So um, the big way of, uh, that we have been speaking about is not to make it race neutral, not to take race out of the discussion, and this is why I made the point about gender isn't because I believe I, I was at the Women's March, it was great, it was wonderful, it was important. It, it's that so often when we t gender gets used to erase race and gender. In other words, the race part of it drops out. <laughs> uh, and we have to look at all of our intersections. So the way to do that is to actually talk about them all rather than to erase them. Um, and to include people who are white because I think that is the major problem is when people say race, they think we're not talking about white people, and so then it's just people of color winning and getting stuff, and then white people losing, <laughs> rather than saying, no, it's not. So I, I, could, I won't go on and on. I've done a lot of research on this, including message testing, but it's uh, when we use a, a collective frame that is racially explicit but helps people who are white feel included in the discussion and, and, their, and their genuine uh, insecurity, economic insecurity uh, uh, recognized, they're much more willing to see the disparities that also exist on race and to see a link um, in terms of some of the policy results that we need. So our argument has always been we have to talk about race and when we talk about it, we have to talk about everyone but we also have to talk about how we're different, but in a way that's about what helps us all. Um, okay, hi. Uh, well, my name is Christina, and thank hi, you so Christina. much for your presentation. It, it actually gave me like a, a, a very important question because um, it shows the way the government a good, functional, well, not a perfect, because we're not perfect, but a very competent, a system works for the benefit of the people, but it is very interesting how you made the com the comparisons with the pub with the private sector, and is there a way the 
the private sector, well, is there where you can see that the, the role of the private sector can be more active into inclusive and participation initiatives? Because oh, yeah. the things that, for example, in my, like in my personal case, there, there are many cases where, of course, that indirectly they contribute because they hire people and they pay taxes with the money they gain. But is there a way that it could be like, like a direct, like in the case of New York, for example, like a more direct participation of the private sector? Because in Europe, we see that they play a huge role oh, in absolutely. the cities. Oh, but, yeah. I mean, they're, you know, argu arguably they have all the power. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we're, but, so, but that doesn't mean they don't have a role. Um, so one of the things, that I'll use broadband as an example, because broadband, the way we've made a decision to deliver that in the U.S. is all a pr is public dollars invested in private companies to build infrastructure. That's what we, I mean, at its simplest, that's how we build broadband in the U.S. And that's why so many people don't have it. Because then if you can't afford the cost that the private sector is demanding for the infrastructure, you just don't have it, right? So um, what we did is we have our contracting, the private sector though has to have what's called a franchise, which is basically just a contract with the city to operate. And so guess what my role was? To renegotiate. So what we said is where does the community benefit? <laughs> You want to contract with us, how does the community benefit? Um, I think the point is there are, uh, g the private sector has partnered with us in many ways. One example is um, private sector recognized that if our public school kids didn't have digital literacy, they wouldn't be ready for the workforce that required digital literacy. We have virtually no computer science in our public school system. Actually, we have none. So what the private sector stepped up and said, and we came to an agreement with them where we said, if we will, the city will put in 50% of the money to create universal computer science if you put in the other 50%. And they said, okay. So we're putting in 40 million and the private sector is putting in 40 million. So that's one example. But the other is accountability of the private sector. It's like you're getting public benefits. What are you giving, in, 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 what are you giving back? So the bet, and, and in our new contracts, and this is the, I, sh I, I didn't share this, but this was also a really exciting one, is we have pay phones, right? So literally physical pay phones all over the city. People weren't using them anymore. They were falling into disrepair. They were, but that's a franchise. Those are private companies that have a contract to dig up our city streets to have their pay phone there. So when that contract came up, we put out a bid that said, tell us, if you want to win the bid, tell us how you're going to create free wireless access at those payphone spots. And so we got, and then we encouraged something else that wasn't happening in our payphone franchise. We said, and you can, and we will view favorably a consortium of businesses. So there's actually a brand new consortium of companies that are creating free wireless, turning our payphones into free one gigabit speed. People are paying for wireless, broadband aren't getting one gigabit speeds in New York. One gigabit speed at the uh, kiosks. We required a rollout that ensured that they got kiosks in low income communities of color outside of Manhattan and in northern Manhattan, right? That became part of our contracting with like you must and then um, they're being rolled out now. Uh, so, but that's a public-private partnership, but where we required equity uh, and accountability, uh, and then we provide a lot of support to their success because uh, engaging residents in its use, but also uh, making sure our agencies that regulate are making it possible for them to innovate because they're doing things that we've never done before as a city, and now they're looking to do the same thing in other cities. Um, but, we've, but it's the first time they've uh, done it, and we've introduced an equity lens into how they do it. So uh, I could go on, but those are, those are kind of primary examples.